Welcome everyone, uh, wherever you connecting to the today's webinar of the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. Uh, my name is Yelena Sokova, I'm the Executive Director of the VCTNT. With the world watching closely, the unfolding war in Ukraine accompanied by threats of invoking nuclear deterrence on the Russian side and heated debates about a possible escalation of the current conflict to a nuclear dimension. Nuclear weapons are on the mind of many experts, politicians, and citizens worldwide. Never since the Cuban Missile Crisis, the potential of the use of nuclear weapons have been so real and captivated the global attention. And while the focus of our today's webinar is on the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, the international treaty that for the first time prohibited the development, possession, use, and the threat of nuclear weapons, the very underpinning of the treaty, its origins and key provisions are extremely important and relevant to the today's this, uh, situation and discussion we have today. Our panelists have all been deeply involved in both the development of ideas and concepts that became the driving factors on the road to the conclusions of the TPNW and in the process of shaping and negotiating the treaty. I am extremely honored uh, and grateful to them for making themselves available today. And uh, I'm sure there is plenty of demand on their time given the situation we found ourselves in and for them sharing their expertise, experience and views. We have a stellar uh, panel um, with uh, Dr. Patricia Lewis, who is research director at Chatham House, but who also played an, uh, an ex critical, extremely crucial and critical role in um, developing some of the concepts related both to the humanitarian um, initiative and looking at deterrence uh, and uh, nuclear weapons risks and other um, connected issues. We also have uh, Ms. Maria Antonietta Hakis, who is a council and political coordinator uh, of the mission of Mexico to the United States, to, to the, sorry, to the United Nations. <laughs> uh, we also have Ambassador Thomas Hainosi, who formerly was director for disarmament, arms control, and non-proliferation at the Federal Ministry for European and International Affairs in Austria, and Ambassador Alexander Kment, who currently directs that department, but who is also president designate of the first meeting of state parties to uh, the uh, TPNW, which is supposed to happen in uh, several months from now. Uh, with uh, just a reminder to our listeners, please, if you do have questions, uh, post them in Q&A rather than in chat. Um, that would be easy for us to have all the questions in one place. Those of you who are watching it on YouTube, uh, you could send them through to events at um, vcdnp. Uh, dot .org. Uh, with that, I think we shall start and uh, devote our time to the treaty and the, uh, the impact of the current situation, but also start with the origins. As I mentioned, um, uh, Dr. Lewis was one of the um, uh, intellectuals and uh, academics who was uh, intimately involved in the development of the origins and ideas that underpin the, both the humanitarian initiative and the delegitimization of nuclear weapons. And I wanted to check with her and ask her to 
walk us back to that time and to the origins and their ideas that underpin the treaty um, and uh, the, uh, both the humanitarian impact and the legal standing of nuclear weapons. Patricia, please. Thank you so much, uh, Elena. Um, I'm so I'm so pleased you're doing this right now. Um, it's, it's such a moment. Uh, it was really really terrible times, um, but it's it's really shown how important this whole discussion and debate is. And I'm really pleased uh, to be on this um, call with Tony, Alex. Uh, and Thomas as well. And um, I think I can see many of our great friends and, and colleagues in, in the list. And it's, it's really good to have a discussion about this. This threat uh, of nuclear weapons use is, is very real again, isn't it? Um, and indeed we can see how NATO nuclear weapons have not deterred war at all. And Russian nuclear weapons are preventing NATO response. So we're in a really rubber hits the road moment on nuclear weapons as we're seeing it unfold. All the concerns that we had, all the sense of urgency that we had back when we started many of these discussions um, is yes, very, very real right now. So I think this is a great um, opportunity that you're giving us, Elena, and, and thank you for doing that. And, and thanks for all the sponsors as well. So my memory of all of this will be different to others, just to say that. Um, the significance I give things, the, um, the emphasis, uh, the sequencing, it will be different. Uh, and there's nobody has the, the rights on, on the history of this. We've all got different views depending, you know, when we came in, when we started thinking about these things, when we all had different roles. Everybody had an important role to play in, in getting this treaty and off, off the ground and also making sure that it gets implemented and you know that nobody um, should feel that they, their, their role in it was any more significant or any more important. That's just not the case. Everybody is important. So bear with me if you disagree with some of what I say or sequencing and you say, oh, you've forgotten this. I undoubtedly will. I've only got now about five minutes. <laughs> So um, I'll do my best. So um, the thinking behind, you asked a question about, you know, what was the thinking behind a lot of this? And, and let me again say there are quite a few of us thinking about this at the time, but it was really um, on the humanitarian impact. It was really when the people working on uh, landmines, cluster munitions, chemical weapons, biological weapons, small arms and light weapons, the arms trade treaty. It was in that period of, of you know, the late 90s to the mid noughties. Um, and it was all about the nature of these weapons, um, how they, they, their humanitarian impact, their terrible, unacceptable harm that they did human rights aspects of it etc and you know the violation of the dictates of the public conscience as it's called in humanitarian uh, law l-o-r-e rather than l-a-w and then the question that we all have when we were doing all of this is you know why isn't nuclear included in this group of weapon systems you know they are by far worse in terms of the humanitarian impact in terms of the um, the unacceptable harm that they do. Why on earth aren't nuclear weapons included in that? And they seem to be a, a, a very different um, category for many countries. They were seen, and I, I kept asking this question, others were asking the question, and what we were told was obviously these are weapons for deterrence. They are not weapons for war fighting. And this is what we were told. And when asked, when we sort of said, well, how do they deter if you're not determined to use them, right? Because that's how they would deter. They, there was a kind of a disconnect, a, a discombobulation almost of people's um, mindsets in which they couldn't quite compute. They got themselves into a terrible logic loop. And we realized that there was a massive disconnect um, in the thinking. Um, and so this is when I was at, at Unida um, back at way, way long ago. And um, with the ICRC um, and some wonderful people in that, we did some digging in the ICRC archives to look at what the debate has been through the ICRC. Because there was at the time 
a reluctance in the ICRC to get involved in um, the issue of nuclear weapons. They were happy to get involved in landmines and cluster munitions and, and small arms and so on, but not in nukes. And it turns out that from about 1954 onwards, um, the Red Cross indeed did do a huge amount on nuclear weapons. And indeed in 1954, they put out a plea to prohibit the use of nuclear weapons and uh, for complete nuclear disarmament. So there was a long history that went through the decades. Uh, you can go through all the archives and it's all reported in various papers of, of the Red Cross and other humanitarian organizations seeing this as primarily a humanitarian issue and needing a humanitarian approach and particularly about preventing the use of nuclear weapons. Um, and then of course there was the Cuban Missile Crisis and there was then a flurry of activity that was centered around the possibility of use again um, and new arms control measures between the US and then the Soviet Union. And of course the environmental impact became as a humanitarian issue became very important with the nuclear weapons testing programs, which are atmospheric. Um, an attempt to ban all weapons tests ended up in a partial ban, what was called the Partial Test Ban Treaty. But that was very much centered on a humanitarian and health approach. So this thread of humanitarian uh, thinking is very deep within the nuclear arms control and um, disarmament communities and non-proliferation communities. And then I guess in the 80s, that kind of became so politicized that international organization like the Red Cross sort of stepped back and were basically told not to become political, not to interfere in this. And there was a muting of this debate. Um, everything became very politicized and it changed. But then, you know, come the 90s, uh, the end of the Cold War, new, new arms control measures, the chemical weapons, and I, I mentioned the others. And so it, it's, it's not surprising that that sort of thinking started up again. And though it, it just so coincided with the um, ICNND, the, um, the, the big effort between Australia and Japan to kind of look again at this whole issue. Um, and um, the issue of the Nuclear Weapons Convention was being touted at the time, which was a convention that was drafted by non-governmental organizations, including uh, with a very small one in Australia at the time called ICANN. Um, and um, people were looking at this, it was, it was a very detailed convention, there were lots of things wrong with it, etc. But the idea behind it was, you know, it's time to, time to look at this. And, and the ICNND uh, looked at the possibilities of all of this and thought that what we could do is come up with a new approach, with a core group of like-minded countries who could take this forward, um, supporting a big NGO public um, communication activity, uh, like how I can turn out to be. Um, and this started to take root. And then come the non-proliferation treaty in 2010 with the agreement um, under the new Obama administration and this new flourishing of the ideas, every, everything seemed to be going in the right direction. But then the conference on disarmament still couldn't achieve anything. It still was stuck. And the whole thing from the non-proliferation treaty rests on the conference on disarmament moving and it, it didn't move. So um, it had to be rethought. And that's when um, we ended up with um, a, a new, new set of ideas of this core group of countries, understanding the urgency. A lot of people talked about it being frustration with the CD, frustration with MT, that's not the case. It was the understanding of the urgency, which I think we now see all too clearly how urgent this is. And, you know, some really key countries like Norway, Mexico, South Africa, Ireland, New Zealand and, and others. Um, Austria, did I mention Austria? I should have done. Um, you know, really uh, made a, a, a enormous effort and, and many other countries got involved, perhaps not so openly. But, you know, the hearts were there, even if the um, governments weren't fully, fully there yet. So that's when we had the uh, humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons conferences, the open ended working group and what led to the TPNW negotiations. So that's how I see the whole framing of it. Just a quick word on deterrence, because you asked me about deterrence. And this was identified as a key issue, because, of course, if nuclear weapons deter conflict, and prevent war, as was being claimed at the time, 
then they should be seen as a good thing, right? Right, so, and that's indeed how many of the ethical moral frameworks would, would think about nuclear weapons, a necessary evil. And indeed the Catholic Church at the time saw it as a balance of evils and saw that if it, they deterred, then they were probably unbalanced better. So nuclear deterrence had a lot of very ethical, very moral thinkers associated with it. And I think it's really important to recognize that. Um, you know, people who, who see nuclear weapons as part of the solution are not immoral, they're not unethical, they see them as a, a contribution to preventing war. And I think right now they'll be thinking quite differently about them. Um, I think as well, in thinking about that, the challenge that we made, that people made, that need, you always need to challenge assumptions, right? This is a very big assumption. And the challenge of those assumptions is, you know, what if it doesn't work? What if it goes wrong by accident? So we had, you know, Eric Schlosser's book coming out on command and control. And what's the history of some of the, of near use, which is what, when we did the Too Close for Comfort report. And these are big challenges to deterrence because the trouble with nuclear deterrence is that there are no small mistakes. Oh, I should have brought in Ward Wilson's work as well on rethinking nuclear deterrence, which is superb work. Um, where you know, there are no small mistakes to be made with nuclear weapons. So you, if you're not absolutely right about nuclear deterrence, then you're absolutely wrong, right? I think that's, that's the key thing. And that's what we had to, to um, uh, look at. And I, I'd like to also mention the work of Serhi uh, Plocky as well, uh, who's just brought out a book on, on some of these issues, particularly looking at new evidence, um, interesting from Ukrainian archives um, on, um, some of the, the big near misses such as Cuba and um, Abel Archer and so on. And then my final question was about uh, the role of humanitarianism versus security. And I would say there is no difference between humanitarianism and security because what we're talking about is human security, how we provide the security for our citizens. And right now I think we can see that nuclear weapons are not providing that security for citizens of Ukraine. And later on, they won't be providing security for anyone if this carries on. So I'll stop there, Elena. I know I've spoken for too long. My apologies. No, no, I think these are important uh, messages. And I'll also thank you for uh, reminding um, about the humanitarian impact and some of the studies that were even carried out in the 50s and 60s in, in uh, later uh, the various developments, because sometimes we just think about it as a more recent um, views on uh, nuclear weapons uh, and their role in deterrence. I, I'm sure we will return to the discussion of the deterrence and the current situation in the uh, follow-up, but you also made a really good segue to the discussion about the uh, humanitarian impact but also in, and also the humanitarian um, impact of nuclear weapons initiative uh, with the three conferences that were held in uh, Oslo, Nayarit, and then Vienna that looked at the um, different aspects associated with both about the, the risks and the impact of the use of nuclear weapons testing and um, many other aspects of uh, nuclear weapons. Um, and I am really delighted that uh, we have uh, Tony here who was uh, now a participant in all three of these uh, uh, conferences, but also very actively involved in the conference in Nairit. So Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elena, for the invitation. And um, I think that this is a very timely discussion and um, it's in a, in a way this is something uh, modern because of the preparations for the first meeting of states parties of the TPNW which is the framework uh, uh, under which we are uh, gathering today also because of the times as Patricia mentioned and I will refer to that in a minute too but but also because it's it's so I mean so long ago but it seems like yesterday in a, in a way, and we we need also to to refresh our memory of uh, of how these um, developments uh, influenced and why we need to look back at them today. 
And I, I want to uh, uh, say that the framework that Patricia gave is, is uh, uh, spot on, and uh, it gives me a, a very good, a very good uh, step in, in, into uh, talking about the, the, the conferences. So uh, uh, my first uh, comment, and maybe a disclaimer, is that of course my, my view is from a, a diplomat and a diplomat uh, from a country that has forgone nuclear weapons a long time ago, 55 years ago, with the establishment of the first nuclear weapon free zone in a densely populated area, which is Latin America and the Caribbean, through the Treaty of Tlatelolco. So in a way, uh, this uh, view about the prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, and, the, and the, the assessment of the, the risks uh, and what they do has been embedded into the Mexican foreign policy for uh, several decades and the same goes for Latin America and the Caribbean. So there is a little bit of, uh, of, of a bias, uh, 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 assertion, assertion and, and appreciation of the, of the facts. But um, I, I, I want to say that the three conferences that took place in 2013 and 2014 uh, were uh, very significant, but uh, were, uh, had, had several intentions. And I want to, to start uh, by making a general, generalization because the, the, the countries that were uh, uh, thinking about this, the core group countries that Patricia mentioned, and especially the host countries, uh, uh, I, I cannot speak for all of them, not even for, for Mexico, but the appreciation is that the countries were uh, 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 having certain certain different intentions that are uh, that were ambiguous at, uh, at several at several moments but that uh, coincided into one thing in at the united nations yes there were four dealing with nuclear weapons and the disarmament and non-proliferation issues but um, uh, mainly the mpt uh, review conference uh, processes and also the conference on disarmament and the disarmament machinery within the un uh, but uh, we member states didn't talk about what weapons do, what the impact of nuclear weapons is, especially from the point of view of the 21st century uh, society. At, at, at best, we had side events in which uh, we were presented with the testimony and, and, and memories of the, of the survivors, the Hibakusha, the survivors from tests, then the academia and NGOs would present us with uh, data and with some ideas regarding how these uh, 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 data can could be made into some project uh, 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 projected uh, uh, results for uh, a, a nuclear detonation in the present, and then uh, we would talk about this, but on the sidelines, on the sidelines of the of, of the. Uh, multilateral negotiation. So, what the, um, in my view, what the three conferences did, and that was one of the questions that you, Elena, requested me to assess, is what, what is the meaning, what is the impact, no, uh, no pun intended or redundancy, of the impact of the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons conferences, is, was, what, uh, from my point of view, it was to, to create um, a venue for a multi-sectorial process in which uh, different actors would have a facts-based uh, discussion uh, based on the data available and the studies uh, and the opinions from civil society, from think tanks, from academia, but also from diplomats and from, from governments and from affected societies about what nuclear weapons do. And that has had not taken place in a, in a formal setting with governments present at the same time that civil society was speaking and that the academia was speaking. So, so that is, we, we, we have done, done that in, in the past in, on the sidelines, I said. So the, the, the three conferences had different focus and the, the discussion in the, in the, in the conferences uh, took different directions. In the conference in Norway in, in March 2013, the focus was on the data pertaining the, the, the potential uh, impact, negative impact human, and humanitarian impact of a nuclear detonation. 
and uh, it was uh, also uh, uh, there were some questions regarding how many countries would attend for example because this was the first time that the process had been launched without a, a, a specific agenda point in a multilateral um, a process emerging from the UN. It was not a programmed conference. It, was a not, it wasn't a pre-budgeted conference. It was an invitation from the government of, of Norway to, to have this dialogue with the experts. So 127 countries uh, attended this, this conference, which represented a high success. And that uh, gave the, 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 the opportunity to the government of Mexico to offer the, the, the follow-up to this, to this conference, and 146 countries attended the, the Nayarit conference uh, that focused on the global uh, impact and the global um, um, the global uh, uh, probability of, of, of damage that nuclear weapons would do. And this is this was an, a very important angle uh, from my point of view, because usually when we are presented with information about nuclear weapons, especially from the point of view of the value of the terrorists or the security of the possessors of nuclear weapons, uh, the, the narrative is presented as if uh, nuclear weapons are necessary for the, for the protection and the security of the societies of the countries that process nuclear weapons, then with total disregard to what the global implications of this uh, 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 impact uh, would be. So that, that angle was the focus of the, of the Nayari conference. And uh, the Vienna conference uh, had another angle, which was the humanitarian and environmental angle, and also the legal aspect pertaining pertaining to the conference and I, I also uh, remember that one of the most important uh, uh, highlights of that conference from my point of view was also to assess the the, the, the testimony of the of the victims of uh, and survivors of testing which uh, uh, are often uh, uh, taken a, a different seat uh, with the, with the, uh, in the com with the conversation going on uh, more centered about the the data from the actual um, uh, attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, so uh, I think that those uh, added value to the discussion. But uh, from the political point of view and and, and responding to the question uh, of what impact these conferences have on the development of the TPNW. Uh, I think that we need to, to uh, also remember that, as I said before, the, the discussion in the United Nations and the multilateral fora was not centered around the, the, what weapons did, neither on the quality or the characteristics of the weapon itself. We didn't, as we didn't talk about the, the weapons, the uh, intrinsic characteristics of the weapons and the impact. And um, we talked about who had the weapons and who couldn't have the weapons and who say they deserve the weapons, <laughs> but uh, we don't uh, talk about what weapons do. And the, the, the facts-based discussion and multi-sectorial multi approach uh, provided by the three conferences uh, uh, in, this, in this period of time provided a sound, a sound basis for another thinking, which is, uh, as Patricia said before, why are these weapons not uh, prohibited as the other weapons of mass destruction? And also why this discussion is not the basis of, that underpins all the work uh, re, uh, related to nuclear weapons in nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. So what the discussion of the three conferences brought back to the multilateral uh, uh, discussion was not at, at the process itself, but why everything else that was being discussed at the Conference on Disarmament and under the MPT framework and uh, in side events and in the first community resolutions, why this mattered, why we needed to uh, consider, uh, for example, the prohibition of fissile material. You cannot talk about prohibition of uh, the testing, the FISA material, and the, and the other processes inside the United Nations if you don't think about prevention of the humanitarian consequences of these weapons. It, 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 it didn't have a, any, any sense. So, so it, it, it brought back a reason, a reason why 
these other processes had to had to work, and that is why I agree that the sense of urgency and the sense of purpose was the main driving force for uh, this facts-based discussion that was needed in the in the in the humanitarian impact uh, of nuclear weapons conferences. I want to finalize with two with two issues. Of course, we need to remember that after the um, uh, conference of Nairi uh, ended, uh, and the, the chair of the of the conference, Ambassador Juan Manuel Gomez Robledo, issued a a, a, a chair summary on on the responsibility of the uh, under the responsibility of the chair. Um, the the rationale for the humanitarian uh, uh, initiative, so-called humanitarian initiative, it was not called like that then, but the, 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 the chair summary pinpointed some of the direction that the, that the humanitarian impact uh, initiative was going to have and uh, 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 framed the results or the conclusions of the, the facts-based discussion as the basis of a process for the first time. Uh, when it said that the, all these uh, data and all these uh, questions regarding the value of nuclear weapons and the potential damage and harm and impact that needed to be prevented uh, should have to be the, the, the basis of, of, a, of a new uh, process with uh, baselines and dates and, uh, and, uh, and a purpose. And especially uh, taking into consideration that weapons, uh, uh, historically, weapons that had been eliminated or that had been uh, 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 in a process of disarmament had been outlawed before. So we needed a, a, a treaty uh, uh, or a new instrument that would explicitly prohibit the nuclear weapons. And uh, uh, that's why the, the chair of the conference uh, considered that the Nayarit conference would have to be the point of no return towards that direction. And uh, I wanted to, to, to highlight that because that, then that gave a, 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 a direction that was uh, completed in the cycle of conferences by the uh, initial national commitment that uh, Austria presented as the uh, Austrian pledge to, to initiate that process. And that uh, uh, national commitment of Austria was later endorsed by the countries of um, Latin America and the Caribbean first, and then by the rest of the world in the humanitarian pledge that gave uh, a, a political commitment that all this data and all this discussion was going to be the basis of a new process. And um, the humanitarian initiative developed over time it was not uh, a, 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 a straightforward approach from the beginning because it had to, to, to manage both this uh, uh, rationale, but also the, the, the political and uh, the philosophical, in some, in some cases, uh, nuances that all countries that are advocating for nuclear disarmament had so that we could converge into this process. My final comment is that uh, we need to, uh, uh, in a way, separate uh, a little bit, not too much, <laughs> but uh, uh, separate at least practically the debate on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons from the prohibition of nuclear weapons and the treaty. Because uh, uh, history has shown, especially uh, now in the, in the multilateral fora and with the environment, and with the deterioration of the environment that we are facing, uh, that um, we need to come back to reminding ourselves of why we need to continue working in multilateral dialogue on nuclear weapons. And it is to, pre to prevent the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons and to prevent these uh, uh, dire uh, circumstances in which uh, uh, we will be uh, and uh, to which there would be no uh, ability to respond as concluded by the conferences. And this is an issue that has to be more relevant today because of the banalization of the use of nuclear weapons that we have been facing uh, in, uh, in the previous years with the uh, uh, Trump administration and now with, uh, with the uh, elevation of the alert 
and uh, this is a, a, an issue that has to be uh, reinforced and this is why uh, I, I would suggest that everybody would have to revisit the uh, presentations at the conferences and all the body of work that has emerged from that and uh, discuss nuclear weapons again on the basis of what they do and not where they are or who has them and uh, because I, I think that 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 is more uh, uh, important and urgent than ever. I finalize my commentary with this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, uh, for working us through this, uh, both the diff all the different uh, uh, conferences and also uh, the thinking behind um, the uh, humanitarian uh, initiative and its role in uh, leading up to the negotiations the discussions of the uh, uh, treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. Um, it's a very interesting point you made about uh, that, that we need to still think uh, separately about both the humanitarian uh, initiative and the prohibition itself. And I, maybe we'll return it um, to the discussion of that. But um, since Austria played such a big role in uh, the uh, process itself and the pledge that you've mentioned already, Tony, uh, was also uh, something that uh, Austria uh, takes credit for. Um, and, and we have two fine <laughs> Austrian diplomats here, but I'm not, I'm going to give the floor first to uh, Thomas, Ambassador Thomas Hainosi, and ask, uh, ask him to remind us both about the treaty itself, its key provisions, also uh, maybe share um, what, uh, how the discussion of these provisions shaped out and what did not find its way into the treaty and why. And also uh, maybe share a few um, of his thoughts about uh, the role of the open-ended working group and uh, why, why was it even possible to negotiate the treaty in such a short time. Uh, Thomas, please. Thank you so much, Elena. And <clears throat> first of all, I really want to thank you for organizing this webinar right now. At a time when we see that nuclear weapons do not protect peace, they just embolden to start a cruel war. And uh, Patricia gave the big intellectual overall picture, and uh, I fully agree with her. And uh, Tony gave a very eloquent overview about uh, the humanitarian conferences. And when you have all this knowledge that we acquired in the humanitarian conferences, of course, um, it's a call to act. And uh, uh, as everybody knows, uh, it hasn't changed over the last years. Also at that time, we are speaking about 2014, about uh, there was a stalemate of nuclear disarmament endeavors and uh, the lack of negotiations given the risks is totally unacceptable. So uh, Mexico, Norway and Austria together started an initiative in the General Assembly under the name Taking Forward Multilateral Nuclear uh, Disarmament Negotiations and uh, this led to two open-ended working groups and uh, uh, they uh, uh, led to real discussions which you didn't have in the CD. I mean, there you give your statement, it's more or less always the same, you don't interact. And uh, so it was a relief for many disarmament diplomats. Finally, they really can talk about uh, nuclear disarmament and the first report was adopted by consensus. And then in the uh, second uh, open-ended working group, um, we were very close to a consensus again, uh, actually at this dinner uh, in the residence of the chairman, uh, we on a personal level had achieved a consensus, but then the next morning, Australia broke the consensus. And why? Because of course, uh, the idea of negotiations of a prohibition treaty was contained in this uh, 
um, uh, consensus uh, text that we had prepared. And uh, uh, so while we regretted it was not possible to have a consensus, of course, uh, there was such a broad majority. So we had a powerful force behind this. And uh, in the General Assembly in 2016, I had the honor to introduce uh, the relevant resolution that contained uh, the mandate for negotiations on the prohibition treaty under the aegis of the United Nations General Assembly in 2017. And this resolution uh, received a broad majority. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the umbrella states that have taken play, uh, part in the open-minded working group, not so the nuclear weapon states, but they were quite active there. Uh, with two exceptions, uh, it was uh, Netherlands and Norway, uh, uh, voted against uh, this resolution. So we had the mandate for the, from the most uh, uh, legitimate, uh, broadest uh, uh, forum in uh, multilateral diplomacy from the United Nations General Assembly to start the negotiations in 2017. And of course, uh, so we did. Uh, it's worthwhile to recall that uh, in Article 6 of the NPT, we read each of the states' parties undertakes to pursue negotiations and so on, leading to nuclear disarmament. Uh, so it's not only for the nuclear weapon states. Uh, we all have a stake in it, since we are all threatened by the nuclear weapons, but also uh, we all have a legal obligation to do something. Uh, to bring about negotiations on nuclear disarmament. Uh, so uh, just sitting back and waiting that the nuclear weapon states finally would be ready to start to negotiate, that uh, is not enough. Uh, of course, the nuclear, non-nuclear weapon states, they cannot destroy the nuclear weapon states' uh, weapons, uh, but they can set a legal norm uh, that is indispensable for nuclear disarmament. Uh, I remember very vividly at the start of the negotiations, uh, the then US ambassador Nick Haley uh, uh, didn't enter the UN General Assembly role and together with some other uh, NATO country ambassadors, not all of them, uh, uh, they gave a press conference in protest outside. And uh, I listened a little bit and she said, uh, well, I mean, for the security of my children, the US should never participate in negotiations that want to prohibit nuclear weapons. And I thought it was a strange statement for a mother. Uh, and uh, inside, I was then chatting with Beatrice Fiend from ICANN, and she remarked to me, uh, uh, it's the world upside down. Usually, we, the NGOs, stand outside uh, in protest. Uh, and, and now uh, I'm inside here, I can speak here, and the US ambassador is uh, um, uh, staying outside of the General Assembly Hall in uh, protest. Uh, so the span of the negotiations, as you have remarked, Elena, was very short, but all participants wanted to get to a, a good result to a treaty text, and uh, uh, they certainly were not eager to uh, get the blame uh, to have brought this historic undertaking down. So we saw this time and again in, in the negotiations that countries that can be very difficult in disarmament negotiations uh, uh, gave rather quickly in when they saw that uh, their position uh, could develop into a stumbling block for the undertaking. Uh, all delegations also were eager to have a strong link to the NPT, and therefore the DPNW is also totally in sync and in line with the NPT. Uh, actually, the prohibition norm is required to fully implement Article 6 of the NPT. So, uh, what I see as the uh, main challenges uh, uh, in the negotiations uh, was 
how comprehensive and detailed should the prohibitions be? And at the same time, they had to be implementable. Uh, so you ask, uh, well, which issue is not in the treaty text among the prohibitions? And one on which we discussed a lot, but finally decided not to include it, uh, was uh, transit. Because how could a small island uh, state effectively implement it when uh, a sub uh, with nuclear weapons is going through its uh, territorial waters? So um, uh, this is not a feel-good treaty. It's a treaty that is very much looking into the implementation. Another challenge was the creation of uh, uh, a credible pathway for nuclear armed states to join before having completed uh, the destruction of the nuclear arsenal. Uh, that was very interesting in the negotiations that uh, uh, this idea carried so much support. But then, of course, when you get down into the detail, it's not that easy. So we worked a lot to achieve this text. And uh, again, it was key. And of course, we managed in the end that is totally um, uh, in sync uh, with the MPT. Uh, another uh, issue which really drew on until the very end of the negotiations was how to phrase victim assistance and environmental remediation. There's a paragraph on it. By the way, I think it's interesting that all previous nuclear disarmament uh, uh, conventions, uh, even uh, political text, uh, never touched this very obvious issue. Uh, uh, so it was not that there was a big controversy and so on, but, but how to hammer it out that it again is implementable uh, and still quite strong. And uh, perhaps the last issue uh, that uh, had to be resolved uh, was the, uh, well, together with the victim assistance issue, uh, simultaneously was the withdrawal clause. Uh, because uh, as I see it, uh, when you prohibit nuclear weapons, the best would be that you cannot withdraw from this. Uh, but uh, if we do not put any text in, then the Vienna Convention, the law of treaties would apply and it would be quite easy to withdraw. So we needed a withdrawal clause. And uh, uh, the one in the NPT with six months uh, notice, that's much too easy. We have seen it with uh, the DPRK. Uh, so we ended up not only with one year, but when a country is in an armed conflict, it cannot withdraw. And I think uh, uh, that was uh, a credible uh, solution for this very fundamental problem. Uh, even so, many thought it would not be possible to conclude the negotiations so quickly. We managed, and on the 7th of July 2017, 102 uh, countries adopted the text. One vote was against the Netherlands, but I think we are very grateful that they came to the negotiations and also engaged. They were just sitting there, then to push the red button. Uh, and uh, one abstention uh, that was a particular uh, problem uh, uh, so that Singapore had. Uh, so uh, what has happened then? Uh, well, uh, the support has grown. We see it, uh, a yearly uh, general assembly resolution uh, on the TPNW that Austria is running that we have more than 122 states, 128, I think was the last one. Uh, so actually it's developing well, even so there's a lot of pushback, of course, from the nuclear weapon states. Why did it come about? I think there were, uh, it was not an easy undertaking. So at the outset, uh, there, there was no guarantee for success, but uh, what we 
uh, got is that finally all those countries that are nuclear weapon free zones and also those that have a nuclear weapon free policy like for example my country Austria they got together and there are many they are uh, the, about the number uh, that, that we have here almost uh, about uh, almost 130 and uh, nuclear weapon free zones are very important but if you are not able to combine the different uh, uh, zones uh, to create a common platform we will not make this big global uh, progress so that was possible the second factor as i see it was that we had for a long time this uh, very boring uh, statement i'm for the comprehensive nuclear weapons convention no country x is uh, for the framework agreement country y is for step by step as approach and then there are some countries like mine that say we don't care which way we get it but we want to get nuclear disarmament uh, uh, so there was a unnecessary split and uh, this split was overcome because in all these approaches you need a prohibition norm uh, so that is was uncontested uh, and uh, uh, they came slowly all uh, aboard even so it's still not a big uh, comprehensive thing but that's a thing we can do because of course as i've mentioned non-nuclear weapons uh, states they can uh, set the legal norm uh, which is a prerequisite for nuclear uh, disarmament and that uh, they should do so and a very important factor uh, of course was this coalition with civil society but also with academia but also the icrc uh, i think uh, that uh, helped tremendously uh, in the undertaking and uh, therefore also the negotiations were a little bit different it was not just uh, diplomats and uh, uh, military uh, it, it was broader uh, we had also always the voice of civil society uh, we, we had panels on the different subjects with leading academics uh, which by the way helped a lot uh, uh, in the progress of the negotiations because you have to establish a common basis of knowledge and for, on that basis then it's easier to find common ground so my last question is what was lost in the negotiations what was lost in the negotiations uh, as i see it was the credibility of the nuclear armed states regarding their wish to achieve a nuclear weapon free world it is only logical that this can never be done without a prohibition law and i remember very well uh, that uh, not only umbrella states but also for example the us uh, has given statements uh, that um, yes the prohibition is necessary for a nuclear weapon free world uh, so so there was no real controversy about this until it was getting serious of course and uh, um, then some of them said uh, 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 at the very end when there are almost no nuclear weapons left but this is not realistic because take the other weapons of mass destruction like chemical weapons biological weapons the prohibition norm uh, uh, cannot wait until the very end when there are almost no weapons left it uh, always uh, comes at the beginning you need this also uh, to start uh, destruction so uh, I regret uh, a lot that uh, the nuclear armed states have not uh, engaged more positively they could have participated while stating uh, the present uh, international tensions they, they, they cannot join but yes it, it is necessary for nuclear disarmament and therefore we are here because we want to get it right such a position would have been fully possible would have earned them a lot of respect uh, their campaign against the treaty 
has never reached uh, the level of a substantial debate. It was just a campaign. Uh, uh, their absence, uh, I fear, was understood as a lack of will to reach nuclear disarmament. And uh, finally, I think it even speeded up the negotiations. Thomas? Yeah. Now I want now I want to be cognizant of the time we have still yeah. uh, all okay. under waiting and and some. No, no, sure. so sorry. Of course, I mean when you live through it, you get carried away. Uh, my apologies. Uh, uh, may I just have one sentence? Uh, it would have been my last one, and uh, is uh, it is that the umbrella states face the usual dilemma: How can you be for nuclear disarmament? when you want to base your security or in the future nuclear uh, weapons. And uh, uh, therefore, I think it is very important uh, that at least some of uh, them will come to the first meeting of states parties, but this is already for Alexander. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas. And um, uh, I'm sure that the the issues that you raised about the linkage with the NPT um, early in your presentation and Article 6 and overall relationship between the NPT and the TPNW um, is something that will come up with, in the discussion as well. Um, I want to give the floor to Ambassador Kment and uh, many of you know of his role both in the uh, uh, hosting the uh, conference in Vienna on the humanitarian issue, the Austrian pledge, and then in the negotiations. I don't have to uh, explain to you more about that, but also wanted to know that for those who are interested in the history and the negotiations of um, the TPNW, um, Alexander uh, had uh, um, published a book uh, on the his, uh, on the uh, how the treaty was achieved and negotiated and uh, I'll ask our staff to post a link in the chat with a link to it but also we hosted Alexander in a webinar at the VCDNP earlier uh, uh, this year in January uh, speaking about the uh, TPNW when the, the treaty entered into force. Alexander, I'm sure that the um, you are getting many questions from everywhere about the uh, first meeting of the state parties, uh, about the agenda, uh, modalities, and everything else. I'm sure that there are many questions now coming to you about the impact of the current situation on the preparations and how it may change uh, the um, both the the conference itself and their organization. So I'd be very grateful if you brief us on that. And th th thank you, Alexander. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I hope you can uh, hear me well. Uh, thank you, Elena, for organizing this event and for inviting me uh, to speak. This is a good opportunity to, to brief uh, uh, about the TPNW also for for colleagues who may not have followed the process so closely uh, and how the treaty came about. And of course, as was pointed out by uh, previous speakers, it comes at an incredibly crucial moment. Uh, I, I, I have the honor of facilitating the preparations for the first meeting of states parties as president designate. And I thought that really one of the key challenges for the meeting of states parties would be the general lack of attention around nuclear weapons. We in the nuclear bubble, we always think that it's a very important issue, but I think we always experienced in the past that the broader public doesn't pay that much attention. Well, I think that has changed dramatically. Um, the, the, the threat of nuclear weapons and the risks of nuclear rhetoric escalating has been brought into sharp focus in the last few days. The risk of nuclear conflict, of escalation, of miscalculation, of human or technical errors in the fog of war is today higher than it's been at any time since the height of the Cold War. And of course, what we have talked about in this whole process is that the consequences of any use of nuclear weapons would be devastating and affect us all 
that nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence carries great risk for the security of all humanity. And this is, of course, exactly what many states parties have been talking about for a long time, have warned about, and what has led many states then to support the humanitarian initiative and ultimately to conclude the TPNW. So the, the, the profound arguments around these issues on which the treaty is based, in my view, are even more vindicated by these terrible, disconcerting developments that we see. And even if we have, of course, some actors see this as a reinforcement of uh, the belief in the, in the validity of nuclear deterrence, I think the conclusion should really be the opposite, or at least a great deal of caution uh, um, in this issue. I think it's, it's, it's absolutely important that any threat of nuclear weapons is categorically rejected as totally irresponsible and, and a violation of the UN Charter. And of course, threat of nuclear weapons is prohibited by the TPNW as well. I hope that this will lead to much more focus on these issues, on, on, on more focus on the TPNW as well, and of course, giving uh, uh, leading states to consider, to more states to consider joining the, the TPNW. And of course, the treaty itself and the meeting of states parties also have increased dramatically in importance given what's going on at the moment. Uh, um, so the, the, the work that we are doing in building up this treaty is even more important now than it was before. I think there will be a lot more scrutiny for the work that we are doing than would have been the case anyway. And there will be some opponents will be even more critical than they have been before, even for some of them that's hardly possible. Uh, but at the same time, there will also be much higher interest. Uh, the public attention to the nuclear weapons issue has returned. There are many people who are really deeply worried and coming out of the pandemic. Uh, now this issue, the fear of nuclear weapons is back. I think the public debate on nuclear weapons will be much, much stronger again. And of course, it ought to be because it's such an existential issue. I was asked uh, uh, specifically to, to, I mean, uh, just, just to conclude that what are the repercussions of the crisis that we see on the disarmament and non-proliferation regime? I think none of us knows. Uh, that's the true answer, except that the repercussions are going to be profound. But how, the, how it's going to fan out is, is of course, uh, is, is, uh, is, uh, is very questionable, but there is a, it's a real threshold and there is a real danger of going back to uh, several decades into, into a situation that we thought we've overcome and we spent decades trying to inch forward. I, I had a colleague talking about that next uh, that uh, uh, 2022 is the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So 60 years ago, we were on the brink. 60 years later, we're again on the brink. So I think that is a very, very important uh, uh, point to think about. So I was asked specifically to talk about next steps for the meeting of states parties. We are, we are preparing this. It's, it's, of course, a key opportunity to set the treaty on a, on a right track for its implementation. We had to postpone the meeting because of the pandemic uh, twice, and now uh, uh, a new date is being uh, set uh, uh, um, in summer. We have just initiated a silence procedure, which will go until the end of the week. So we hope to have clarity very soon on the date. Uh, but it's either in uh, it, it's 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 in it's in summer, June or July. Um, uh, and of course, the inclusivity is absolutely a central issue we really we really need this is a democrat it comes from a democratic body the general assembly it was a democratic process and it represents a democratic approach to nuclear to the nuclear weapons debate so it's very important we had to postpone it to really make sure that all stakeholders can participate what are the priorities uh, i think states parties have been extremely clear in these consultations that have been going on for a year now that they want a message of, of seriousness coming out of the meeting of states parties, that this is a new treaty, it's based on strong arguments, and that we are preparing this meeting with as much seriousness as we can. Uh, we have important decisions to take, both procedural ones and substantive ones that need to be prepared thoroughly, and we are building this new treaty and this new 
regime in a serious way. Uh, I think that's the, the first priority. The second thing that is absolutely uncontested and very clear, we want to have a clear focus on the humanitarian consequences and risks. This is the sort of going back to basics uh, uh, of where this initiative comes from. And maybe the most, uh, and, and of course, it couldn't be more pertinent to, to, to raise these issues uh, than, than now, but the, the sort of most tangible um, way to do is, is to look at the positive obligations of the treaty on victim assistance, on an environmental remediation and cooperation and assistance. Because we have several states parties, uh, Kazakhstan, for example, or the Pacific Island states, or Algeria, that's a signatory state, that have to this day communities uh, and, and, and uh, vast uh, areas of land that are extremely seriously impacted by past nuclear weapons testing. So uh, the treaty contains positive obligations to build a cooperative system, a sort of culture of work of how to focus on the on the plight of humans, on, on the plight of victims, and how what we can do together to address this humanitarian harm. I think this is a very important aspect also to underline the, the, the imperative of the preventative approach that, of course, underpins the treaty. Then there are some very important technical aspects. Uh, uh, we have to set uh, some deadlines that the negotiations task the first meeting of states parties uh, to, to, to set. I'm happy to talk about more in the Q&A. Um, we have to initiate a discussion on future designation of a competent international authority or authorities that would uh, oversee the elimination process once nuclear armed states uh, are ready to join. Uh, that has to be done in a, in a detailed and technically sound way. And then we are also talking about uh, and preparing how to harness scientific advice for the treaty regime, uh, which of course links to the technical aspects that I've just mentioned, but going beyond that, also on the humanitarian consequences and risks uh, of nuclear weapons. So we really want to scope what's out there in the scientific community in terms of relevant research on those issues. And I hope from, from my perspective, at least, this could be a very important deliverable of the first meeting of states parties, uh, to, to, uh, which, which, which may have benefits, of course, crucial ones for the TPNW, but be of great uh, value beyond the TPNW as well. Then it was already mentioned, uh, very clear states parties want an absolutely crystal clear, unequivocal statement and message of the complementarity of the TPMW with uh, the regime coming out of the meeting of states parties, which of course is maybe predominantly the NPT, but not only, but uh, the um, uh, multilateral regime in its entirety. And then there are, of course, some very important uh, uh, procedural issues that need to be tackled. This rules of procedure is probably boring, but it's extremely important. We want to set up this treaty implementation in an avant-garde way, that this is an open treaty, open to the participation of broader stakeholders, because the conviction is there that we will actually only make change Transformer, transformational change on nuclear weapons if the debate on nuclear weapons is much, much broader than it's been in the past. We really need more of a multi-stakeholder and broad societal engagement on these issues. And then another important aspect is how to set up the implementation work, the intercessional work of the treaty. I'm, I'm almost finished. Uh, I can see in your face that you're watching the time. I have a couple of small points. Uh, so this is the focus to prepare the decisions well. Uh, to prepare the meeting of states parties well, to make sure that we uh, demonstrate uh, a clear, confident and strong message that it's coming out of the meeting of states parties on the treaty, on the humanitarian arguments, on its democratic and inclusive character, on the urgency of progress, and that this is all uh, extremely important. And, and, and uh, um, of course, we, we know that this takes place against the somewhat antagonistic background uh, by some actors, but uh, I have to say that we also see that uh, some states that are opposed to the prohibition aspect of the treaty have shown uh, a different 
attitude uh, now that the treaty is in force. So there has to, there, there, there will have to be a way of, of uh, engaging constructively because the arguments on which the treaty is based are supported by a very, very large portion of the international community. Then the last aspect is outreach you asked, uh, which of course is sort of in reach in many ways to make sure that, that really all the states parties and stakeholders can participate, but it's also outreach to non-states parties, and we are doing what we can to, to be transparent and inform about the plans and the expectations. It's of course the UN convened meeting of states parties, the Secretary General is the depository, so all states are invited to participate either as states parties or as observers, and, and I would make the point that one can agree or disagree with the legal dimension of the TPW, but there is absolutely no reason and no justification not to engage constructively and substantively with the profound underlying arguments of the, of the treaty. It's a treaty that is supported, as I said, by a very, very large, uh, a large majority of the international com community, actually. And, and, and we are preparing this meeting in a serious way and will be welcoming to those who want to engage uh, con constructively. And, and lastly, I think, especially given the, the, the heightened attention and the dramatic developments that we see, and many people in our states, uh, uh, whether they are states parties of the TPNW or not, are deeply worried and are seriously concerned about this issue. So I think it's absolutely necessary for all responsible actors on this issue to, to show constructive engagement and to be ready to, to uh, engage constructively in the discussions in Vienna. And, and I stop here. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Alexander. And thank you for both uh, kind of bringing the today's situation um, and the upcoming uh, TPNW uh, meeting, the first meeting of state parties um, together. And um, one thing that you mentioned uh, about the growing number of interests, I know that uh, Norway and Germany have already announced that they, they would like to be observers uh, at the first meeting. And maybe quickly, um, if, you, if there are, have been any additional uh, requests and suggestions, maybe you could update quickly on that. Well, um... From states that are not uh, um, that, that have not ratified or signed the treaty, we have uh, um, we know that Sweden, Switzerland, and Finland will be participating, and from uh, NATO countries or um, umbrella countries, to use that term. So far, it's only uh, the what we've heard from Norway and uh, and Germany. But as I said, we are doing outreach. Of course, we will not uh, and cannot force anyone to come, but uh, we, we are, it's got to be the decision of those countries not to come because the, the, the messages that come out from the TPNW and the preparations of the meeting is that one should come. Thank you for that clarification. We'll um, move to the uh, questions, although uh, we have uh, very little time left for them. So I will have to juggle and maybe call on you uh, for some uh, of the interventions. Uh, we've already started, many of you addressed the current situation and the impact, uh, and maybe we'll end our discussion with your um, points on, on um, what, what should we do right now, what, what else we could do in terms of both discussing in the um, government for international for, but also um, as citizens, as non-governmental uh, experts and others. But one issue that I do want to bring up, and I would appreciate if uh, um, some of you or all of you could address is the um, question about the uh, impact of the current situation, not only on the TPNW, but on other international uh, treaties and uh, um, the, the work of the entire system um, from UN to uh, everything else. Ambassador Susan Burke, uh, big welcome to you, is asking, um, 
that there is a much anticipation about the long delayed NPT review conference now planned in, planned in for August. Uh, to say that the nuclear landscape has changed in the intervening years would be an understatement. What efforts are being made by the parties to find some common ground given the TPNW's uh, entry into force, uh, Putin's nuclear saber rattling, change in US government leadership, I'm here it's uh, referring to um, from Trump to, uh, uh, to Biden uh, and so forth. What outcomes are um, visible and how do you see the upcoming NPT review conference? And also because my understanding is that TPNW will be preceding the NPT review conference. How do you see the interplay between the two? Um, and um, I'm going to call on um, maybe both Patricia and Alexander and Tony, if you like to chime in. Uh, who would like to go first? Um, Patricia, please. Yeah, sorry, I have to go at exactly 3.30. So if you, oh, sorry, I know that's 4.30 your time. but um, So I, I wanted to, um, I think that it's a really important question. I think we can't see very far ahead right now in terms of what might happen in, in Ukraine. But, you know, we're in the state of, of war and um, nuclear weapons have been threatened. And I think that this changes the game completely for the NPT and the TPNW. How it will be handled diplomatically, I don't know. We're seeing already the impact on the Iran talks. It would be very interesting to see how um, North Korea um, talks, if there are any, might go ahead. Um, it'd be really important to see if China takes sides in this. Um, we're hoping that China will will offer itself as a honest broker, but we're not seeing that yet. I just wanted to say that I think what we are seeing right now, and it's important that we take stock of this, is that we're seeing that nuclear weapons use is incompatible with values that are often described as Western, but I'd rather not describe them that way. Uh, values that are about human rights, about um, civil liberties, about the protection of civilians, humanitarian and the rule of law. These are not Western values, they should be shared human values. And we're seeing that nuclear weapons, the threat to use nuclear weapons is incompatible with those values. And I think that's really important. And I think there are people in Russia who share those values. And we have seen before how you know, individual Russian heroes um, have stepped forward and prevented nuclear war. And I'm hoping that those people still exist. Um, and so that's really, I, I think we can't approach any of this anymore in the way that we did before. This is no longer just a diplomatic process. This is not about wordsmithing. This is about something very real and very dangerous. So we need to change our attitude. And I think the TPNW negotiators really understood that. And so for those who can't join the TPNW yet for various reasons, I would call on them to observe the meeting, to turn up and observe. And I would call on all those outside the NPT to also turn up and observe the NPT. And there are mechanisms to do that. And, they, and countries have done it in the past and I welcome it. Thank you, Patricia. Alexander and Tony, would you like to add? Tony? Sure. I think Alexander was going to go first. <laughs> now go ahead. Tony. OK, thank you. Very, very quickly. Uh, I think that this is a crucial question. I want to offer a couple of uh, uh, points of view regarding the state of, the, uh, of play. Of course, we are facing um, uh, a, a, a very uh, a, a perturbing crisis. Uh, uh, the, 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 pertaining to the MPT, uh, this is not the first time that the MPT is going to meet under under a crisis. We need to. I am not uh, uh, demeaning, or I am not on the uh, on the playing 
the, the crisis or the, the urgency that we're facing. But we need to remember that the, the APP has been um, in, into force for 50, 50 plus years, and this is not the first time. And it has worked under a, a pressure and under a crisis situation. So here the, the, the question is whether the nuclear weapon states uh, agree that this treaty uh, and the regime established by it is something that we need to preserve or that we need to uh, continue undermining until it is not even recognizable. And uh, uh, because of that uh, uh, disjunctive and this, this danger that we are facing is why we need to come back to uh, addressing these issues from the point of view of the prevention of the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. And yes, this is the first time that um, the, the treaty is uh, uh, going to be uh, examined, the MPP, uh, uh, in a crisis in a long time. It is also the first time that it's going to meet under uh, the framework of a, of a prohibition of nuclear weapons accepted by a majority of the parties of the MPP as the, as the basis for the discussion. So the, the, the discussion has been changed. Uh, my last comment would be uh, also to look at the international uh, multilateral disarmament machinery. And I think it is the, the time to really took to heart a very uh, serious and uh, serene a discussion about uh, whether the fora that we have in the United Nations to address these issues uh, uh, are fit for purpose and are fulfilling their mandates and are a useful vehicle for incentivizing the decision making processes. Because what we are seeing uh, from the Security Council to the first committee to the MPP is that there are a lot of mechanisms that are obstacles for the decision making processes. So I am not even focusing on what outcome are we going to get, but how can we get there when there are so many uh, uh, crises and conflicts uh, obstacleizing the decision making processes. So I think that we also need to look at that at the disarmament machinery as a whole uh, uh, from the point of view of this century, not of 1945 and the Cold War scenario. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. That actually uh, intersects with some of the questions that came uh, to our speakers, particularly uh, about the current international system being able to, to deal with these issues. Uh, and, uh, and the crisis that we're experiencing um, and uh, also uh, the linkage with the existence of nuclear weapons and inability to uh, adjust the system and work around it. Maybe um, we can address it if we have time, but we're running quickly out of time. Before I, uh, Alexander, I'll give you the floor. I wanted to know to our uh, listeners and participants that we, uh, of course, won't be able to address all the questions that you raised. Uh, I can um, asking my team here supporting us maybe to copy these questions and we'll see if we can uh, answer them separately or send it to uh, panel participants. So my apology in advance to it. And I also know that Ambassador Lave, who's also listening, wanted to take the floor probably we won't have time for doing that to Alfredo, my uh, regrets and uh, apology. Um, Alexander, the um, floor is yours. Thank you. Just very briefly, first of all, I, I agree with, uh, wholeheartedly agree with the comments from Patricia and, and, and Tony. Um, I think we, we are in, in real danger to lose a lot uh, that has been carefully built over the past decades if we are not very careful. Um, so in terms of the regime, that is the multi-generational effort in many ways. Uh, um, and we are in danger of falling back. Uh, and you see some voices who uh, seem to want to walk us back to a arms race, multiple arms race. Uh, we've seen that, we've done that, we know how dangerous it is. So we have to be extremely cash, uh, cautious and responsible. Um, so TPNW states parties without exception are all staunch supporters of the NPT. 
Um, that's very clear. So we are, we have done the TPNW in many ways to support the NPT. So we will be very responsible in the NPT as well. So I would hope that rather building on the comments that Patricia had made on the universal values, rather than creating sort of artificial divisions uh, um, that it's the, it's the states that really deeply care about multilateralism and about these values, about the UN Charter, about universal human rights, that they rally up around those aspects rather than continue to um, vilify an absolute clearly good faith eff um, effort that the TPNW represents that we find a way to engage constructively on those extremely important issues, a readiness to have a different kind of discussion on nuclear weapons. I think that is absolutely warranted uh, at, at that juncture. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. Maybe just a follow-up question to you, uh, to your original intervention. There is a question about whether, um, if there are parliamentarians from states that have not yet joined the TPNW that are interested in attending the first meeting of state parties, even if their governments uh, do not attend um, as observer state, um, um, there is an assumption that the, the, the attendance, their attendance is parliamentarian is impossible. I just wanted to clarify it with you if that understanding is correct. Alexander, you're muted. There is large interest uh, from parliamentarians, uh, both from states parties, but also from non-states parties to participate. And we are, we are looking to find ways to make this possible. Uh, there is, of course, the IPU as a framework. There are some NGOs. Uh, uh, so uh, there also, I know that uh, from civil society side, a number of side events uh, related specifically, giving a forum specifically to parliamentarians are in the planning. So the, the, um, I think it would be very important to have parliamentarians uh, uh, present. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. What I'm going to do is to give each of you 30 seconds if you want to take the floor for the final comments and messages before we close down, because we're rapidly approaching the hour. Uh, I know, Patricia, you need to leave, and I know the, um, we haven't had a chance also to hear from uh, Ambassador Hainosi. Patricia, uh, final comments before we... Uh... No, just, just to thank you all for, for participating and um, you know, joining in the discussion and to hope and pray that we get through this uh, situation safely and can then address the issue of nuclear weapons properly once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. I wish the same to all of us as well and everybody who joined us. Um, um, Thomas? Yeah, my, my conclusion from the recent events is uh, we cannot go on to pretend that nuclear weapons uh, uh, can keep us safe. We know that they are great danger even to our survival of the whole mankind. And uh, uh, this all pessimism that might be justified, we should recall uh, that major progress in nuclear dis disarmament always came about at times of uh, tensions. So I, I really hope that uh, we will be able to see this also this time. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Indeed, it's. Uh... We did uh, probably needed a little bit of a shock and, and wake up uh, to focus on these issues, but hopefully we uh, would see progress in this area. Um, Tony and Alexander for your final words. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that it is uh, very important that we don't um, uh, uh, disregard the issues pertaining in nu nuclear weapons and the treaties surrounding them and the multilateral forum that uh, that address nuclear weapons as something of the past and as something that is the embedded in the 
Cold War scenario of the 20th century. Uh, this is uh, a, a very important current issue uh, that needs to be studied, that needs to be taken up by the young uh, generations of students, of uh, civil society activists, but also of young diplomats that need to continue uh, 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 studying and, and, and learning uh, from all these processes and from all these coalition building exercises that have uh, produced uh, very good results as the PKNW, uh, uh, because we need to learn that the, the difference of this crisis is that it is happening when nuclear weapons have already been uh, prohibited in international law. As, as uh, In comparison with other crises, we have now a legal standard to which uh, come back to sanity and to uh, call uh, on the right uh, 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 values and uh, choices to make as diplomats and as scholars and public in general. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Alexander, you're muted. Sorry, not a comment, but a bit of information. Um, before the meeting of states parties, which is a three day meeting, Austria will organize a separate standalone one day conference immediately on the day before the meeting of states parties on the humanitarian consequences and risks of nuclear weapons. The idea is that uh, many of the points that were raised today have been discussed in international conference several years ago and uh, uh, maybe many stakeholders, uh, colleagues, experts are not so familiar anymore with what was discussed at those conferences. So we will partly recapitulate what has been presented at these conferences in uh, Norway, Mexico, and Austria. But we will also look at some of the really important uh, research that has happened in the, in the years since, both related to humanitarian consequences and to risks, which I think is extremely put, uh, uh, pertinent uh, right now. It will, of course, set the scene for the meeting of states parties. Uh, that's why we do it, but it will be hopefully an important contribution to raising awareness, uh, um, uh, irrespective of the meeting of states parties. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, and thank you all. Thank you, Patricia, Tony, Thomas, uh, for uh, joining us today for um, in this particularly difficult time where we're all worried about uh, where this war will lead and um, many people are um, unfortunately learning about nuclear weapons and the, the threats they pose um, in a very short time and um, both family members and friends and civil society now ask much more, many more questions about these issues. I am really grateful for your very um, uh, deep thoughts about both on the treaty's origin, but also about the situation we found ourselves today. And I really want to for all, uh, join Patricia in wishing us all to um, come out of it stronger with the, um, hopefully no <laughs> um, nuclear weapons use or further did escalation. Uh, and uh, I really want for all of you to join uh, me in wishing uh, Ambassador Kment, um, Alexander, for um, the uh, work um, you're doing in, in uh, preparing for that meeting. And I'm sure we all of us will be available and um, happy to contribute as much as we can both uh, to the discussions we're having about the nuclear weapons, but for the first meeting of state parties as well. I also want to thank uh, on behalf of our, our participants today, uh, you particularly for making yourself available, but also thank our participants who joined us and uh, we'll have a recording of this uh, discussion in a few days. And uh, those of you who had to leave earlier will be able to see it in, in the entirety and others watch as well. With that, thank you all. Um, we're going to close the um, today's webinar. Thank you.